Today we're asking this question. What is a worthy sacrifice? What is a right sacrifice? Let's take a look at what the Bible says about sacrifice, right, to get us, uh, get us going. In Romans 12, verse 1. Um, It says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In Hebrews 12.10, it says, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The Bible doesn't disentangle sacrifice from worship. Sacrifice from praise. Sacrifice is indeed an expression of our worship. Telling him thank you, telling others of God's goodness, sharing with others. All of these things are sacrifices. And at the same time, they're expressions of worship. And the Christian belief, I don't know what's going on. (laughs) Sounds like I'm in space. Um, The Christian belief is that what you were made to worship God. Commonly heard objection that I hear all the time is this. Why does God demand our worship? I hear this all the time uh, from young people and from people that are skeptics that grew up in the church and then later they say, what's with God? Like, why does he need us to worship him? What type of deity is so insecure that he needs me to tell him that he's good? Does God's glory somehow increase with our good praise? Or if we mock him, does that somehow diminish how good he is? C.S. Lewis answered this, um, and I think in a really good way. He said, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. But God wills our good, and our good is to love him. And if we know him, we shall, in fact, fall on our faces before him. And if we do not, it only shows that what we are trying to love is not yet God. Though it may be the nearest approximation to God, which our thought and fantasy can attain. He sells that in the problem of pain. Until we surrender our lives to what we were made for, worship, until we turn our lives into a sacrifice of praise, joy will elude you. Your heart will be forever restless until it finds its rest in its proper place, until it finds its rest in the enjoyment of God, until it learns to worship. As you can see, it's clear that to offer a sacrifice to God is what we're we're supposed to do, and that the sacrifice is an expression of worship. But is it possible that we are putting our blood, sweat, and tears, all of our effort into our lives, and yet... Our sacrifice is not being counted as acceptable before God. It's not being counted as worthy. I want to say today, yes, that is possible. Obviously, this would be a terrible outcome. To strive and to strive and to strive and present an unworthy sacrifice to God. To demonstrate how this is possible and how to avoid doing so, we're going to be looking at two Bible stories today. The story of Cain and Abel and the story of the prodigal son. Each of these stories have two brothers, they have two sacrifices, and one sacrifice is accepted while the other brother's sacrifice is rejected. And that brother, in turn, is consumed with envy, resentment, and discontentment. So let's start with Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, it's an ancient story, it's a profound story, and it's a brief story, and let's read it together. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. 
Cain spoke to his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So this is the first of the two stories. And as I said, each story has two brothers. Here we have Cain and Abel. Two, sacrifice, two sacrifices. Abel, offer, Abel offers the firstborn of his flock. Cain offers the fruit of the ground. God accepts Abel's sacrifice. He rejects Cain's sacrifice. So let's begin by looking at the two brothers. Cain's name means to acquire. When Eve bore Cain, she said, I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. And that was to explain the meaning of the name Cain. And Abel, the word in Hebrew is habel, which is the same word used in Ecclesiastes when the author says, life is like a breath, nothing but vapor, here one minute, then gone the next. That's the meaning of Abel, breath, vapor, vanity, which is really interesting when you consider the outcome of Cable's life, or Abel's life. It was cut short, cut down by the envy of his brother. His life was like a breath, a vapor. I think his name the meaning of his name is meant to tell us something about the story. Two sacrifices. Here's what's interesting about the two sacrifices. Both Cain and Abel gave, sacri gave sacrifices out of their occupations, out of what they do for a living. Abel brought God the firstborn of his flock. He's a shepherd. Cain brought the fruits of the land. He's a farmer. Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's wasn't, and as a result, Cain gets angry and despondent because he wanted validation and acceptance that he saw his brother receive. The difference between the two brothers is that Cain wanted to be accepted on account of the work of his hands. Yet God does not accept us that way. He didn't accept Abel that way, he didn't accept Cain that way, and he won't accept you that way. God is not opposed to our effort, but he's absolutely opposed to us earning anything from him. God is not opposed to our effort, but he's opposed to us earning. Commenting on this story, Augustine writes, in accepting or refusing our sacrifices, God is looking to man's good. God does not derive any benefit from our worship, but we do. God was inviting Cain to experience relationship with him and instead of accepting the, God, the gracious offer of God, Cain tries to acquire God's approval by the work of his hands. If we're being honest, how many of us use what we do as a means to acquire validation for our existence, to acquire acceptance? And we do this because it actually works for a while. But it inevitably leads to envy because once someone else comes along who is more accomplished than you and starts stealing the recognition that you used to have exclusively, you're not going to be able to accept them, not if you have been deriving your meaning, the justification for your existence from your work. You will constantly be trying to justify your worth to others, and you'll start tearing the other person down, or else it will suck all of the meaning out of your life. John Gielgud, the great British actor in his autobiographical essay, says this, when Sir Lawrence Oliver played Hamlet in 1948 and the critics raved, I wept. When the critics raved for him, I wept. He was rejoicing and therefore I was weeping. That's envy. When I was in a band, I used to be in a band called Red Umbrella, I put way too much of my identity in the praise that our band received. A positive album review or a concert and I'd be flying high. A not so favorable review and I'd be in the dumps. I remember at this one point, the band Kings of Leon was becoming like a really ro relevant and popular band, and all of my friends were like jumping on that Kings of Leon bandwagon. Crystal loved them, which really stung. <laughs> and I just couldn't bring myself to enjoy them. I resented their talent because it sucked all the praise of my friends and my community away from my band. What foolishness, seriously. And here's the kicker, I didn't even realize that I was doing it. I genuinely believed that I just thought their music was bad. And I'd always try to point it out to others. You know, that guitar solo it was not good. Meanwhile, I'd be ignoring all of the amazing guitar solos. That guitar tone is terrible. I mean, my old be thinking, man, the rest of that album sounds incredible. I was fooling myself. 
In his great little book on envy, Joseph, Joseph Epstein says, the stigma of envy is its enormous pettiness. And you can see when I tell you the story, you think, man, that's petty. It's so petty, because we, and we won't even admit it to ourselves. That's why we try to be self-deceivers. This is exactly what happened to Cain. You see, he was deriving his meaning from his occupation, and when God rejected his sacrifice but accepted, his, accepted Abel's, his justification for his existence was depleted because he was putting his justification for his existence on the thing that he did. And the pain that he felt when he looked upon Abel's favorable, favorable response is what we call envy. Envy is pain. The Bible says we should rejoice with those who we rejoice and we should weep with those who weep. But envy flips this on its head and says rejoice when people are weeping and weep when people are rejoicing. Bertrand Russell said that envy is one of the most potent causes of unhappiness. See, our world has it backwards. The world says it's what you do that gives you value, but God says it's because you are made in his image that you give value to what you do. The world says it's what you do that gives you value, but God says it's because you are made in the image of God that what you do is valuable. I think if you're honest, you'll say that's a belief that we wrestle with. God did not accept Abel's sacrifice because the work of his hands met the divine expectations, but rather, as Hebrews tells us, God accepted Abel's sacrifice because he offered it in faith. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through faith, and, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks today. Cain gave his sacrifice without faith. Cain expected God to commend him for the work of his hands and the sweat of his brow. Abel, on the other hand, gave his sacrifice with faith. He gave his sacrifice knowing that it was not enough to earn God's will. He gave a relational thank you to God. Picture a man with his young son out at a well. And they're drawing water from the well. And the father, you know, invites his son to take a little bit of the rope. He asks him to join in, in the work, because he desires to be in relationship with his son. And the son loves participating alongside the father because he looks up to his strong father and desires to be like him. The son's participation in the work is a relational participation, and it's a joyful experience. The father's got all, this, all the poundage on the rope. The, the young son is just in front of him, helping. This is the way Abel understood his sacrifice before the Lord. In faith, he gave his sacrifice as a gift to his father. His sacrifice was a relational sign of his thanks and gratitude. But Cain is like the son who is helping his father pull up the water from the well, except that he actually believes that it's his strength that he's pulling up the water out of the well with. He believes that his dad actually owes him something, and he's got his hand out saying, Dad, pay up. <laughs> I, I helped you get that water out. In Cain's mind, what's happening is unjust. His work is just as good, if not better than Abel's. Abel's just a mere shepherd. Cain thinks that God accepted Abel because of his work. He thinks that Abel earned something from God. He did not. It's all grace. Abel got what he did not deserve, namely acceptance from God because he desired relationship through faith. Cain, on the other hand, got what he deserved because the work of our hands will never be enough. Remember that I said Cain's name means to acquire and Abel's name means vapor and mist? It's clear the name Abel means uh, something and it was significant to the story. And I believe Abel's name tells us something about his story and his life as well. As we see, Abel, right from the beginning, he was trying to acquire God's acceptance. That was his name. His name means to acquire. He was trying to acquire God's acceptance on his own. It's also interesting to note after he kills his brother Abel, he goes on, and his life was all about acquiring a name for himself. So after he kills his brother Abel, he goes to a city called Nod, and he has a son named Enoch, and he names the city after Enoch in Genesis 4. He's trying to make a name for himself. Then six generations later in Cain's line, it reaches a kind of diabolical fullness in this descendant named Lamech, who took two wives, and it's the first record of polygamy in scripture. Cain's line is just a disaster of evil, and it all starts with Cain trying to acquire a name for himself. Now, 
let's take a look at another line that's running parallel to Cain's. So Abel is killed, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore him a son named Seth. Seth has a son named Enosh, and Enosh marks a critical turning point in human's history. It says, at that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Cain was trying to make a name for himself by having a son and name a city after him. But when Seth had a son, the son's work was not for himself, but rather for God, calling upon the name of the Lord. And Augustine, commenting on these two lines, said, Cain represents the city of man. Cain's line represents man trying to acquire a name for himself, whereas Seth's line represents the city of God. It's when man acknowledges his role as giving all, play, all praise and all glory to God. Now we're going to go take a look at the prodigal son story. First of all, who's the prodigal son story addressed to? Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the scribes who were grumbling at the fact that Jesus was eating with sinners. So what character in the prodigal son story do you think Jesus wanted them to observe? The oldest brother. You all will recall the parable. In what would have been a massive sign of disrespect, the younger brother asks his father for an early inheritance. He leaves the farm and the responsibilities to go pursue his own desires, to pursue what he considers to be the good life. And the Bible says he squandered every penny on reckless living and eventually found himself working with pigs. And for a Jewish person, pigs are unclean, so it was a sign of the depths of his fall. Then the son comes to his senses, And comes back to his father. He says to himself, perhaps my father will accept me. Maybe he'll accept me back not as a son, but as a slave, because at least his slaves get treated fairly. At least that would be good. However, in an unexpected gesture, the father runs to meet his son on the road as he's far off. And the son nervously gives the father his rehearsed speech, saying, Father, I've sinned against you. Will you please take me back as a servant? father doesn't even respond to him, but instead hugs him and kisses him and asks that a robe be put on his back and a ring on his finger so that his relationship with the father can be restored. And they kill a fattened calf and they have a party. In this case, the prodigal son is like Abel and his offering, the fa his, offering his sacrifice to the father is simply this, here I am. I know I don't deserve anything, but I have faith that you are good and so I give you all that I am. And in response, the father sweeps him off his feet and says, yes, son, I will take you back. My son is lost and now he's, he's been found. Yes, I desire you and I want to be in relationship with you. Now the older son in the story, he's like Cain. You see, the older son also had a sacrifice that he presented before the father. His sacrifice was the years of sweat and hard work that he put in while his younger brother squandered the family inheritance. His sacrifice was responsibility in the face of reckless living. His sacrifice was that he stayed. And the older son expects that his father ought to see the hard work, and on this account, he should be accepted and he should be celebrated. Then he gets word that the father is throwing a huge party, and he immediately becomes filled with envy. He storms to his father and pleads his case, saying, I stayed, I worked, not him. I deserve this, not him. And in a sign of disapproval, he refuses to be anywhere near the party. He refused to be in a relationship with his father by faith, through grace, but instead he insisted that he be accepted by works. He insisted that he be accepted by works. Cain and the older brother were envious because they were trying to extract their identity and their worth from the things that they put their hand to. They insisted on the earning the very thing that man can never earn. We only envy because we believe the things that we envy will make us happy. If I had their approval, then would people would rightly acknowledge my worth, and then I would be happy and content. If I had their spouse, then I would be able to thrive and be happy. If only I had their possessions, then I would be able to enjoy life and be happy. If only I had those friends, then I would be able to have fun and be happy. Our envies are based upon the things that we believe will satisfy. Our envies blind us to the fact that God is in control of all things and wants to see us use our current lot in life for his glory 
and for, his, for your good, for your satisfaction, and for your joy. Where you are right now in your current circumstances and all of your mess, God is inviting you to lay it down at his feet and saying, here I am, here it is. This is the good news. Perhaps you've been living your life like Cain and like the older brother, trying to prove to God and to man that your existence is justified and that you're worthy on your merit. You're trying to make yourself worthy and acceptable. Perhaps you haven't realized that your relationship with God is not a relationship at all, but rather just a list of responsibilities and duties, and you keep trying again and again to present yourself before God as deserving of his acceptance. The good news is that you have nothing to offer God. You never have, you never will, and the beauty is that it's not something you've even lost at one point, nor is it something you could ever gain. You simply have to stop striving and start seeing yourself as the child who's helping his father pull the bucket up from the well. God doesn't need you. He desires you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. You simply have to say, here I am. Take me. We get what we, des- we, get what we don't deserve because Jesus got what he did not deserve. We deserve condemnation, but in Jesus, there is no condemnation. We deserve death, but in Jesus, we get eternal life. We deserve to be slaves to our sin, but in Christ, we are redeemed. We deserve to be forsaken, but instead, we are in Christ, and he is in us. We deserve to be rejected, but Jesus Christ takes us as his bride. 